everyone. Welcome to another episode of BFF, a show where two best friends review movies because fan friction. We're your hosts. I'm Ashley. And I'm Joe. And this episode is just a little weird. All right, so um, this week's fight was supposed to be Amy, Kimber, and Trish. And uh, because of circumstances involving, I think, New York City Comic Con, yeah, Amy had to drop out of the fight. Work, super important, we understand. Yeah, so Jack was like, Joe, could you please fight? So I did, and as you can tell, I sound odd. I mean, I I did, I agreed. (laughs) Uh, And as you can tell, I sound odd because yesterday or the day before, I started feeling like I was coming down with something. So now I'm fighting a fight I wasn't prepared for earlier (laughs) in the week. It wasn't (laughs) mentally there. And uh, I'm, I'm feeling a little under the weather, but... It's all good. Yeah, it's good. So, I think you've got some good choices. So because of the situations we're involved in, the just because of the questions, there were only two movies. In which were Eastern Promises and the Entourage movie. <sighs> yeah, and really... Originally, we were going to go with the Entourage movie. And, it was one we hadn't seen, and we never would have seen this movie otherwise. No, like I've seen one sequence of episodes of Entourage where he was Aquaman, and the movie premiered, and yeah. they had rolling blackouts in California because, you know, topical humor. Right. And they were worried about nobody seeing the movie, and then it ended up being that they grossed higher than Spider-Man, which I was just laughing at, not just because that sounded so ridiculous, but because, really, Aquaman? Back then. Back especially then, back Aquaman then. was such a joke we're not going to buy that movie to watch it because because no. that was our only option yes. we couldn't rent it anywhere so it was kind of default eastern promises which was a movie that i had heard of didn't really know a lot about other than vigo mortensen was in it and kind of the title intrigued me just because like what does that mean eastern promises make definitely made me think of uh, something ha- involving Russia because, you know, Russia is technically the East. Yeah. When you think about Which, especially in Cold War perspective. Right. Which it, uh, al- aligned with that, I also kind of felt like it was about, like, Russian stuff. I mm-hmm. wasn't sure what it was because I remember when they were advertising this movie and it was just, like, a collection of scenes and, like, one with him in his underwear and, like, tattoos. And that's about it. Yeah, I don't even remember when this movie came out or any advertising for it. But I think I'd heard it, like, you know, mentioned on Twitter several times. And So we are going to take just a quick little break right here just so that we can gather our thoughts on the movie and then come back for the second uh, portion with a more proper review of the movie. Yep. All right, guys, we're back after our brief discussion of what we wanted to talk about during this movie. And again, like we said, you know, we had decided to review it in the middle of watching it. Really, like in the first probably like 10 minutes of the movie, we were just automatically like, let's just go with this. Yeah, we were immediately I was immediately engaged with the story and just intrigued by like all of the cinematography and the characters and I, I was just instantly engaged and made me super excited. It, it's tone and it's pacing was really good. And it started off with some like mysterious stuff going on and you're not sure what's going on to hook you and drag you in. Yeah. Like it starts off where the, it's like a barber shop and the guy's telling the story mixed in Russian and English. And you, I just got the feeling immediately like this, something bad is about to happen when like his nephew came in and, he and pulled was, the blinds made the shop close. And, and with the whole, like, the the tool, the shaving tool. The razor. Yes, like, thank you. And it's like, oh, this is going to be bad. And they hold no no holds barred in this. They just, like, slit the guy's throat and blood everywhere. Like, you know this is going to be an bad. intense movie. Yeah. So what were some of your favorite scenes from Eastern Promises? I mean, there was just so much that was great about the movie. It's hard to just pick, like, all the little things that we could talk about. <laughs> Um, a lot of my scenes involved actually, oddly enough, Kirill. Okay. Uh, I think one of my favorites is the end. There's that feeling of apprehension that it's like, I know he's not the main character and I know we're not, I'm not trying to defend Kirill as a good person. Mm-hmm. He's, he's definitely he's not. not. But there's that moment where you're like, his humanity is just kind of hanging in the balance. Is what, does he, does he do what his father wants him to do and basically kill his sister? Yeah. Or does he listen to, uh... Who, someone who thinks is his friend. Yeah, Nikolai. Who's lying to him <laughs> and hand the girl over. So uh, I, I really liked that scene. I thought it was well done, but it was followed up by something kind of silly. Like yeah, the with that, that. that little kiss moment, which they do kind of subtly set up. <clears throat> 
that there's some tension there, but it's yeah, but they, they didn't they need to. It. They didn't need to do that. Just having them like hold, looking over the baby would have been fine enough yeah. anyway. Um, uh, I thought Carol had a lot of great character development, like you said. He's not a main character. He's definitely not a good person by any means, but he just seems like a guy that wants to do well by his papa, as he refers to the uh, yeah. Simeon, like you know, papa. Like he wants to make him proud. Papa just happens to be a horrible person. And the only way you can make Papa proud is by is... doing horrible things. Which it, the the movie says that he can't bring himself to hurt Tatiana, and he can't bring himself to hurt the little baby. It is just a little baby, Papa. Yeah. As he says, and so I thought, yeah, great character arc for him. I thought all of the characters were very three dimensional and well rounded. Even tire fire racist uncle. I, one of my favorite scenes is when they're in the burger shop waiting for Nikolai to show up and uh, Stepan goes and gets them some coffees and he also has a burger and fries and, and uh, Anna's mother, Helen, is like, how can you eat right now? Like, I'm hungry. Like, yeah, whatever. What, what do you want me to tell you? And he um, always talks about how he was in the KGB, but they're like, what did you really do in the KGB? And yeah. you get this feeling that... He's either lying or... He was like a pencil pusher. Yeah, like some kind of basic person. But, but you, I, you get the feeling that maybe he was attached somehow because even uh, Nikolai at one point mentions, like, your your uncle's old school. He knows how this goes. Yeah. He knows when I showed up and I'm like, you get on a plane and you go to Scotland. He yes. got on a plane and went to Scotland without question. Exactly. And this is the... And then with the whole, like, diary exchange, and they don't get the information they want, and she confronts him, and then, like, spits it, when Stepan st spits in Nikolai's face, and at the end, like, he's just like, geez. like, I'm coming after you, like, yeah. you're, you're dead. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it, it's a good movie, it's a fantastic movie, um, I, I love this movie. It was so good, and I just kind of knew in the first probably like 10 minutes or so that even though it was about some dark themes, like I was going to just, I was instantly engaged and I knew I was going to enjoy this movie. Yep. So it was so great. And another great scene that I liked um, was when uh, Nikolai has to be called away with um, like Carol and them to go and fix the, the problem from the beginning of the movie. Right. And, He's just, like, so nonchalant about having to do these things to this. Cut off a dude's finger. Yes, yeah, so it's just, like, whatever. And it's and just the relationship between Nikolai and Kirill, I think, is just, it's very interesting. You can kind of see in the beginning of the movie how. There's a really close link. And Kirill is very enamored with, with Nikolai. Nikolai. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering if uh, if it part of it is because Nikolai is that tough kind of guy that Carol might have always wanted to be yes. or um, all that kind of stuff. I don't know. It's a fantastic movie. There's a lot of layers. There's probably stuff we don't even notice. No, and this is definitely one of those ones where I want to watch it again and see if I can kind of not pick it apart, but just, you know, like, what do you notice? Like, what little yeah. subtleties do you miss on a first viewing and... I'd, I'd buy this movie. Yes, this is definitely something that would be worthy of having in our limited DVD collection. Yep, or digital collection. <laughs> yes, whatever. whatever. Uh, uh, any other favorite parts that stand out to you? Um, I really enjoyed the realization later on also. Because at first I thought it was just... Um, uh, was it Azim, I think is his name? Or the the guy who, who... The barber. The barber who cut the dude's throat. Yeah, the I think that's beginning. Azim. Um. I really enjoyed that uh, – I kind of got the impression that he was setting up Nikolai on his own mm -hmm. um, to be Carol whenever the guys came yeah. to the thing. But then even later when Carol's like, I didn't know that my papa was setting you up. I didn't know this was going to happen. Um, I'm like, okay, that that's a really clever way because it, then, it, then it makes me go all the way back. The only reason uh, Simeon even – promoted Nikolai was so he would be exactly a, it was a patsy a patsy to get Kirill killed mm -hmm. so to save Kirill's life which at the other level means that even though he's even worse possibly the worst person in the movie but Simeon still has a soft pop for soft spot for his idiot son yes that's kind of the impression you get the whole movie is Simeon just like he he doesn't 
like his son. Yeah, he seems very kind of annoyed. Disappointed. Disappointed, disappointed. and annoyed in him and easily sends him away to talk to Nikolai about like being promoted. And it's like, no, you and you go get the, the brandy from the cellar all by yourself. And yeah. Yeah, doesn't really treat him very well. and But he promoted Nikolai, literally put Nikolai out there to get killed mm-hmm. to save Kirill's life. For Kirill doing something stupid that he Simeon didn't even want him to do in the first place. Yes, yeah, like going behind his back and... You Killing know. this guy, getting this guy killed and all sorts of other stuff. Yeah. So, um, it, it was just a fantastic movie, and I wholeheartedly endorse this movie. Yeah, another scene that I thought was very powerful was the one where Simeon shows up at her hospital. Yeah. Like, he knows where she works, Holy and he's cow. you always can tell with the interactions with him and Anna. Hey, he's trying to find out, like, where he can get to her. Yep. And, and he, when he shows up at the hospital, you know that something bad later will happen because, like, oh, I know where you work. And when he says says all those things about uh, Kirill being the one that uh, committed the crimes against Tatiana, we haven't learned yet that that's not true. And yep. But we know that this person is not someone that we can trust. No. It's funny to think that uh, what he the links he went to to keep the information about him being the little girl's father mm-hmm. as opposed to, like, if Kirill was really the little girl's father, yeah. he put uh, Nikolai up on the chopping block to save Kirill's life. Mm-hmm. What would he have done in this circumstance, too? Would he have burned the whole hospital down? I don't want to know what he would have done, but that ju- that scene was just so visceral and, like, a very quiet scene, uh, which most of the scenes in the movie are very quiet, except for you know the bathhouse action, which we will talk and anytime about. And they're at a party, like the yeah. party with the weird Thor-looking dude. Yeah, that guy the, was weird. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know. It, it was it was cool, but the guy was like almost entrancingly. He looked like, very odd. And it's not like in a bad way. He wasn't no, unattractive. Distinct. It's just this is very distinctive. It's almost like like. He looked like he could have played Thor. Yeah, he looked like he could have played Thor. But going back to the hospital scene, <coughs> uh, you just you just get the, a deep feeling in your heart that this is not good, that that yeah. little girl, Christine, is not safe. Nope. This man is going to do something bad. Yep. And it's and like something bad is gonna happen to Anna and her family because if he can get to her at work, he can find he can find her. These people have connections and they're dangerous. I will point out because we've done the prestige in the previous episode. Yes. Um, I think this is a really good example of layering the story mm-hmm. in such a way where you find out bit by bit, but it's it's presented to you in order. Yeah. So like we talked about that in previous episodes yes. where like that was something I wasn't a fan of was the really out of out of order. Shoot. Yeah, the non. There's only one movie I give a pass to for that, and it's Pulp Fiction, mm-hmm. which is the only Tarantino film I truly greatly enjoy. Oh, I know another non-linear movie you like, Deadpool. Yeah, but <laughs> I I would have been fine like that it's was not but as, that was it's not as weird. Deadpool's more straightforward. I felt like Deadpool's very straightforward, <laughs> and it doesn't do it to where it's like all over. It's the not place. all over the place. Um, no, it's, and it's, it's not. Very, it's, I think as Sam rightfully pointed out, like 146 time jumps. Yeah. In in, in prestige. prestige, yeah, it is. Um, but uh, this one presents you a story where every scene we're getting a little bit more of the layer mm-hmm. of what really happened. Yes, and the we're truth. never flashing back to what happened. No, we're never shown what happened because Cronenberg's a good director. He knows yes. he doesn't need to do that. He's fantastic. Yeah, um, one more scene that I would like to point out, and if you have another scene, feel free to share. I really loved it when Nikolai was in the hospital and that Interpol agent guy showed up. Oh, yeah. That was just a great... Yeah. He's like, we're going to need your security clearance for this patient, sir. And you're like, oh, yeah, this is bad. (laughs) And this is where we learn that he is some kind of undercover agent. And he's he's like, we're going to take you off the case. And he, like, flashes his star tattoos. And... Like, look, I'm already in really deep. If you let me go it's now, this is going to be a waste of these tattoos. And the guy is like, oh, man. Yep. Man. He didn't yeah. say it that way, but, but, but he was no, thinking it. Was, it. It, was, uh, it was a fantastic scene because it's something I called <laughs> yeah. back when they fished up uh, that his, one body. And his note, yeah. Because uh, yeah. he even makes <laughs> a mention is like, that using was... a dead body to do a progress report, that's... Creative. That's very creative, and yeah, Nikolai lets him know, like, I'm going to be the boss of this organization. Like, mm-hmm. we're taking Simeon down, and you cannot let me go now. And what I really liked about it is, in any other director's hands, or in 
And the majority of directors' hands that aren't like in that art tour level, they would have thrown that away so early in the movie. They would have let you know, like we can't let them it know. Been super that obvious. We can't let Vigo be a bad guy the whole time. We gotta let them know that he's really good and he's not really bad. Which they do that, but they don't to the level of letting them know. It's not so heavy handed. In any other director's hand, or at least in most of our like blockbuster, big budget kind of directors, they would have made uh, sure that Anna knew at the end that he was really a good person. Which... And I'm so glad that Cronenberg had the uh, foresight, foresight to know like that needs to remain a mystery. And it's not that she doesn't know he's a good person, but she doesn't question like she doesn't question that he's not a good person. Yeah. She just doesn't know that he's a cop. Yes. She doesn't know that he's not really a criminal. That he's yeah. he, she doesn't know that he's doing this for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. She just thinks that he's, he's a criminal with a heart of gold. Yes, and again, any other director would be like, We need to let them know that he's really good and oh, let's get them married, you know, some yep. kind of horrible thing. The kiss thing was kind of the what set me over the edge on like, this being, like, a perfect movie. Yeah. Um, uh, I was halfway expecting any other director at the end, when it's doing that camera pan scene through uh -huh. the house at Christmas the next year or something yeah. like that, where uh, I was expecting to see, like, Viggo Mortensen there. Like, <laughs> that would have been horrible. That would have been so, so bad. bad. <laughs> but I think that's the strength of that ending shot, uh -huh. where, like, he's sitting there flipping his little bead yes. beads that he has, and I think he wanted to be there kind of thing. Like, uh -huh. he did want that kind of life, but... This is the life he's got now. Yeah, and I love how that shot parallels an earlier shot of Simeon, uh, like reading reading, paper. reading the paper and just you know like reflecting on his evilness. <laughs> yeah, on the empire he's building. <laughs> yes, but yeah, if they had done the whole like shot and then you see Nikolai at their house, yeah. that would have been so bad, like in a sweater vest or something. But you could still see his tattoo. <laughs> Somebody please make that because I want to see that so bad. Like not in a good way. No, <laughs> that would be horrible. Like Mr. Rogers' <coughs> neighborhood, <laughs> Mr. Nikolai's neighborhood. Mr. Rogers, uh, false story. Yeah, was it supposed to be next Christmas or was it Easter? Because it looked kind of like Easter time. I don't know. If... Some other major holiday where yeah. there's hams and turkeys uh, and hams. things. All right, but uh, yeah, in so, general. So yeah, um, good. Yeah, overall really good. What would you give it out of 10? I'm probably going to give it like a 9. A 9? Yeah, yeah, I think 9 is good for this movie because that one part was just so bothered me. And that doesn't even bother me that much. But <laughs> like, you know, I don't know. It's just one of those situations where it's it's not quite a 10 out of 10 for me. A 9 is yeah. probably about as good as I can go. Yeah. But, but it's fantastic. It was a very, it's a high 9. Yeah, very well crafted. I guess all that's left is... Uh, fan friction fight yeah so, so we'll see we, how that goes yeah alrighty we don't know hey everyone we're back and fan friction episode 206 is all done and nice try joe yeah it, it just wasn't in the cards for you no nah. No, it was not. I was rooting for you the whole time. I felt so bad. I was you tweeting. You apparently weren't rooting for me becoming a speaker for the the Holy Temple of Giver. <laughs> yeah, I don't want you going to the airport and trying to convert people. Anyway, so yeah, you you did a phenomenal job. But, it was a valiant effort. But you, it was just, it felt like every time Jack was like, and Joe's eliminated first. But we're not here to talk about your choice. We're here to talk about Trisha's choice. The question was, in honor of Trisha's YouTube show, The Naked Truth, what's the best nude scene in a movie? And, of course, Trish chose Eastern Promises. What did you and Kimber choose? Uh, I chose the mutant farm fight from Deadpool, where a naked Ryan Reynolds fights uh, the character known as Ajax. Uh, and Kimber chose the breakup scene from Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Yeah, and I liked how all of these were male characters. Kimber pointed that out in the round. Yes, yeah, she did. And so the things that Trish had to say about Eastern Promises were that it was very much grounded in reality, that there would be no way that Vigo Mortensen's character, Nikolai, would be able to hold a towel while he's trying to fight for his life. Or get up when it's over. Exactly. Um, I've never been sliced across my back or my chest by a dude with a small razor sharp knife, but I would imagine I would not want to move after that because that's cutting into muscle. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a very brutal scene, but at the same time, it's also kind of unintentionally hilarious. Yeah, because it's it's what a realistic fight scene in a a bathhouse would be. Yeah, like you're slipping all over the place and. <laughs> And there's these two guys that are not leaving. The, they're just kind of like, one's huddled in the corner and the other guy breaks for it later. But it's like, why didn't you leave when you saw two dudes show up in leather jackets? Yeah. <laughs> like, what was wrong with those people? Right. It was a very intense fight scene. Very brutal fight scene. Yeah, very... Uh, she talked about the raw vulnerability because of uh, Vigo's character not having any clothes on. And just the impact that it had and all sorts of other... Like, she was very good at arguing her point, but she's a professional, so... Yeah, well, and in general, she was passionate about this movie. Yes, very passionate Much about like it. Much like I was passionate about Guyver in round one, but that didn't give me anything. <laughs> Major point that she made was the realism. Yes, and it was. Because at the end of the day, he's huddled on top of one of the guys who just tried to kill him. Mm -hmm. Like gasping for air bleeding all over the place trying to get up but his body's not responding so yeah and i like how she said it was very artfully done and it was a layered scene and she compared it to a symp a symphony mm -hmm. and it was pure art and i thought that was a really uh great argument i thought that would have won mm -hmm. the round uh, some of the things that uh, Kimber said to tear down her argument were that there are apparently other fight scenes that are like this already, uh, particularly in the movie Bronson. Mm -hmm. She brought that up, and so th this was nothing new, and there, it had been done better. And, of course, your fight is, you know, very similar, apparently also was inspired by Eastern Promises. I didn't look that information. I didn't find that anywhere when I was doing my research for this fight. And uh, I, I'm not I'm not doubting that it's true. No, I found it, it earlier. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. true. Yeah, I, I'm not doubting that it's true at all. Or I'm not doubting that it's true. It is totally true. I am like found it, and in general, when she said it, I'm just like, yeah, that makes sense. Well, <laughs> you The look on your face. Yeah, because I didn't know how to argue it at that point. I'm just like, mine is better? Yeah, mine is better because there are explosions. There, there, I, I, <laughs> and it's mutants. I, be, I believe <laughs> the problem is I I explained why I thought it was better in the wrong way. Uh -huh. I explained, oh, there's mutants and there's fire and there's explosions. <laughs> but I should have gone into how the stakes are raised. Yes. Because there are other lives on the line and Eastern Promises is just Viggo Mortensen. Yeah, that would be a good point, you know, in hindsight. I, I like that. <laughs> because of Deadpool, Ryan Reynolds, Wade's, whatever you want to call him, uh, Wade's actions to break free, he inadvertently killed every other single person in that place but Ajax. Yeah, so that was... I remember you brought up the point about his friend and Jack started laughing. All that guy wanted to do was make banana pancakes for his daughter. <laughs> I, It's really sad, but of all the things... When we were watching that in the theater, the first time we saw that movie, uh -huh. whenever he looked over to the side after he'd been impaled with the rebar and mm -hmm. Francis bent the rebar yeah, so around, he, yeah, exactly. uh, he out. looks over and he sees his friend lying on the ground looking at him. I'm just like, I think in the theater, I was like, he's never going to get to make banana pancakes. Oh. It really affected me in the theater. Yeah. So it, 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 it really did. And it was just the emotional things. And I think that's kind of why in Deadpool, and it does, it Again, hindsight is twenty twenty. Yes, it always um, is. Much like I made the argument against the forgetting Sarah Marshall incident where it's like, oh, he just wrote this scene because he three days later he's like, this argument would have been better if I'd done this. Uh -huh. But um, I think it's one of those situations where you see it in the very beginning and you see it throughout other parts of the story that Deadpool – Though not a hero, mm -hmm. it definitely has like a, a mercenary with a heart of gold thing going on. Um, and I think this is part of that situation because when he tries to do things entirely for himself, people get hurt. Yeah. Um, when I, he tried to break out because he was afraid, people died. When he didn't man up and talk to Vanessa as soon as he got out, people got hurt. Mm -hmm. Or she got kidnapped and all sorts of other stuff, so... All things that you should have said. All things I should have said. <laughs> the other time. All right, so I think we were talking about something with the fight. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, you kind of argued all of the cool things 
that I, I tried to argue substance, but I moved away from that argument. Yeah, and it went and like, I there's moved. explosions, and he, it's on fire. <laughs> I decided to go for the more, the 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 funny argument. Uh-huh. I tried to go for the argument because it made, because the, the comment about banana pancakes, uh-huh. which that's just messed up, Jack. That's messed up. You don't laugh that a man can't make banana pancakes for his daughter anymore. You're a father. <laughs> um, but, uh. <laughs> Uh, but that's the thing. Like I tried arguing that and then I, I even threw that in there and yeah, it's kind of a funny thing to have in an argument that this, this one dude wanted to make banana pancakes for his daughter. And it's such a weird thing. You're going for that emotional appeal, but it didn't work. It did not. Uh, I also liked when you brought up that you mean Ryan Reynolds isn't Deadpool. You were just reaching at that point. I was, I was trying to get laughs. Yeah. But, uh, and then I was kind of surprised that, you know, because Trisha's argument for the realism was so passionate. Uh, and then nothing to knock Kimber's choice, but um, I thought it was, you know, I was just a little shocked because she had brought up so much. And Kimber didn't really get to speak a lot of her piece in the fight, but she did have a really good point about how, like, because hers was based in reality. And it, you know, I thought the point that really won the day for Kimber was when she. Um, when she said hers sets the tone for the whole movie, and then Trish never really countered that, and no one ever countered that, and then in Jack's summation of the round, he kind of brought up, well... That's a really strong thing Kimber said. Yeah, yeah. and the fact that the Eastern Promises scene is just really a moment in the movie, but you could take that moment out and replace it with something else, and you're not going to lose anything in the movie. It wouldn't have... It didn't have to be a nude scene Mm -hmm. for that scene to matter so much. Yeah, they could have had the fight anywhere. Yeah. He could have been caught... Leaving a store. Yeah. Um, and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, so I guess before we move on to tweets, we should rank uh, Trisha's choice mm-hmm. against the question, which again was, what's the best nude scene in a movie? So, you know, not an awkward question to try to rank at all. Right. Um, it's definitely a non-traditional choice. Yeah. So, you know what? Just because it's non-traditional, I'm going to give her a 10 out of 10. Um, I see, and I'm going to do the same, but I think all the, all the choices in this round deserve that. Yeah. Because they are nude scenes and they are really good parts of those movies. Uh, and they get the point across. I mean, uh, so yeah, 10 out of 10 for me too. All right, guys. So we wanted to hear from you and we wanted to know, uh, what your favorite Viggo Mortensen movie was. Samuel Catlin at Sister Mary Elephant. Uh, said Young Guns 2. Yes, and I had to double check to make sure that this actually had Viggo Mortensen in it because the picture that Sam posted has Emilio Estevez in it. And Viggo Mortensen has 13th billing, according to IMDb. So that doesn't mean he's not in it. I know, but I just thought it was kind of funny. Look, we didn't ask what your favorite his Viggo, favorite Viggo Mortensen role was. That's true. We, we did not. I just thought it was funny. Yeah, yeah. Morgan Robinson at the Purple Dawn said that he, honestly, I loved Captain Fantastic from this year. Phenomenal performance from Vigo that needs to be checked out. That's I've never the, even heard of that movie. I know it came out, I think over the summer, it was an indie film release. It hmm. was, I know it was one that it was kind of on my radar, but indie films usually come to our town for one day only. And if they do, they come to the theater that's in the heart of downtown that we can't easily get to. Yeah, so that's definitely one that I would like to check out. Yeah. Hamza Juzer at Hamza Juzer said, uh, my favorite is Eastern Promises, captivating performance by Mortensen and Naomi Watts, and a guaranteed future classic. I would definitely agree with that statement. Yes, this movie is glorious awesome and one that we you know we probably wouldn't have given the time of day to uh kimber barrett at sj plus junkie said call me a hobbit but he'll always be aragorn to me i mean that's fair but that's kind of like saying david Tennant's best bo- only body of work is doctor who well, I think I was surprised that more people didn't say Lord of the Rings stuff, to be honest. Um, I think it's because you probably could have gotten a handful of other actors and it probably would have been a very similar job. But not that Viggo yeah. Mortensen did badly. It's no. just it's the kind of role that I think a lot of people could do. Yeah, I loved him as mm-hmm. Aragorn and uh, that was I thought he did a great job at he that. Did. So I totally agree with Kimber. Um, Eric Monroe at Mr. M- MMKOCH200, I have no clue how to pronounce that, uh, said, the although 
going with Lord of the Rings is an obvious choice. He's going to go with G.I. Jane. And our friend Janine at Janine DeBean also said that G.I. Jane was her choice after joking about 28 Days. Which, yeah, I've never seen either of those movies. Yeah. Probably should see G.I. Jane. Yeah, I remember G.I. Jane, people freaked out because... Everyone made a huge deal about that Demi movie. Moore shaved her head. Oh no, she shaved her head and she was pretty. Uh, Randall Sands at Randall Sands. My favorite v- Vigo film is A History of Violence. God, why? <laughs> With Hidalgo With the... as a close second. But those are like his worst movies. These, Well, let's see what he had to say. He said these allowed him to show off his acting chops more than Lord of the Rings. That's not a good argument. <laughs> I, yeah, I've seen Hidalgo. That's the one with the horse race in the Arabian Desert. And I fact-checked that movie because we were showing it, not for my class, but back when I subbed. And it was shown in a geography class. And half the movie is historically inaccurate. Well, it's not just that. It's just, it's not a very fun movie. It's not very good. I don't know. Yeah, that, we had, I had This to, is all my opinion. Yeah, I had to watch that like six times in one day. So mm-hmm. yeah, over the course of like three days. So yeah. And then Amy Awesome, The History of Violence. Amy, I thought you had better taste than that. Michael Atkinson, It's Still a History of Violence. I want to see Captain Fantastic, though. Michael. Oh, Billy, not you too. Not a History of Violence, Billy. Come on. And Kingslayer, our friend Cal, A History of Violence. And he showed us the poster. Cal, why? So, yeah, if the, I think we mentioned this earlier. I think we've mentioned this in more than one episode. I think we've mentioned this on Twitter several times. That we hate, with a passion, a history of violence. Yes. We. I remember the day vividly that we yes. went to see that movie. Because we went to the wrong theater. Because our friends... Didn't tell us the right theater. Yeah, so we had to, like, rush back to the crappier theater in our town. Yep. Uh, and then we were lucky enough that a friend of ours paid for our tickets. $3 matinee. $3 matinee. On a Sunday. Yep. Um, so we went to go see this movie, and we sat through it. And at the very end of the movie, we just both kind of went... What? Yeah. This It was not... The best parts of the movie mm-hmm. were the fight scenes. Yeah, I remember that being really and cool. And then... Um, was it Ed Helms? No. Ed Harris. Harris, okay. Yeah, Ed Helms is totally a different person than Ed Harris. <laughs> so, like, the best parts about this movie are the fight scenes. Uh-huh. And then almost any scene with Ed Harris because he is a truly menacing villain. Yes. Um, but, yeah, we yeah, have a history of hating this movie, but if everybody else likes it, then are we wrong? No, they are. But how will we know if we don't check ourselves again? I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Guys, should we rewatch A History of Violence and see if our opinion has changed in 10 years or so? Have our tastes matured? <laughs> I don't know. So you guys let us know. Maybe we'll put a poll out there. Maybe we'll do a very special BFF where we <laughs> suffer through A History of Violence for you guys. Yeah, because... I, I, I feel you. I don't want to watch it either. I don't. I remember that stair scene. Ugh. No, that's, that's... Mm, uncomfortable. Anyway, so yeah, let us know if we should rewatch that. And we'll, if we if you want us to, we'll, we'll do an episode. A very special BFF episode. The, on f- a... the very first part will just be us going like, why? <laughs> why are you making why us do you this? Making us do this? We'll just redo, use this footage. We won't well, even yeah. need to f- f- shoot anything we'll do like new. like a previously on BFF. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. So, um, if you really, really want us to rewatch this movie, leave it in the comments or message us on Twitter. Tweet at, tweet at us. Something, anything. Maybe we'll pull a poll out there. Attach it to an arrow and fire it to light the fires of Gondor. Send the message that way if you have to. <laughs> um, whatever. Anyway, so that's about all from us. You can follow us on Twitter and let us know whether or not we should watch A History of Violence over again. I'm at Drake Masters. And I'm at that underscore Mrs. Davis. Uh, please like this video if you liked it. Please, leave it. yeah, leave comments. Let us know what you liked. Kindly let us know what you didn't. Yeah, constructive criticism is always uh, We want to improve the show. Yeah, because you, as you can tell, we so know what we're doing. We suck at this. <laughs>
Um, we have no lighting. We have no money. We have no good camera. But we do it anyway because we want to entertain you. Mm-hmm. Come back. See you yeah. on the next episode. All right, guys. I'm now going to write a movie about this. You're going to write a movie about and, it. What's it going to be called? I don't know. You don't know? Forgetting my mistakes in fan friction. <laughs> I'm sure that will make so much money at the box office. Maybe. I mean, that's a billion dollar movie right there. I'm a schlubby white, go- white dude who uh, <laughs> who is got problems that aren't really problems. Who so has got problems? Who's got problems that aren't really problems. So I'd imagine it'll do incredibly well in the theater. So Hollywood, look out for this new movie coming in 2018. Uh, Forgetting my mistakes in fan friction. Yeah, the BFF movie, because I'm sure I'm going to be in it too. Maybe. I'm the girl with the lightning round problems. It could be a fake love story about us. Oh, I don't get to be in your fake movie that you're never going to make? I mean, maybe. (laughs) You're so dorky. All right, so back on topic, and I'll cut all that stuff out probably. Not all of it. Oh, well, I'll keep some of it in. Yeah, some of it. And some of it might be in the cut reel. You like know. this would make really good for the cut reel. Oh, no, I don't think so. You don't get to tell me. I just, you asked my opinion for the cut reel earlier. <laughs> Why don't you edit this episode, then we'll see how it turns out. Well, if you wanted to hit YouTube at some point, you probably shouldn't have me do that. <laughs>